Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Albert, Director of the School of Music Industry at Loyola University, New Orleans. Our guest for this episode of Music Industry Forum is Ken Vandermark. Ken is based in Chicago. He's a musician, composer, instigator, man who makes things happen, a MacArthur Fellow, and one of the co-founders of Catalytic Sound, which is a musician cooperative developed to help musicians um, who make creative and improvised music make a living from that music. Catalytic Sound is, is a collective of 30 musicians who work in uh, for lack of a better word, the experimental music and improvised music field. Um, it started several years ago out of a conversation, an ongoing conversation that I was having with Paul Nelson Love, uh, Matt Skissis, and Peter Broetzman uh, about the fact that we had all these records from independent labels and it was very difficult to get those materials to fans. Like you'd go on tour, you'd bring records out, but especially if you're on tour for a while, uh, let's say in, I was on tour in Europe for a month, you can only take so many records with you and people would always, there's always, they were always looking for things that we couldn't get to them and, and so I finally got fed up with that conversation. It was during the period when the Tentet, uh, the Peter Brosman Chicago Tentet was in action and I just said let's, let's do it, let's make an online record store with our catalogs because we had lots of records uh, we can get them to Chicago and I can ship them from there. Well, I'll sort it out. So that was the beginning. Uh, very quickly after that started, Joe McPhee uh, was part of it. And the idea was just to have an online record store. Uh, long story short, it built out from that inception and became uh, to survive. We Because uh, it got to a point where the, the financial of it, like I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, literally no idea. That's how all good projects start. <laughs> yeah, in this case, that was definitely definitely true. I mean, I didn't even know I needed a city license to have a business. I, I just thought, you know, I'll sell records online. I didn't know, like, any of the details. It screwed up my taxes for, like, three years because I didn't know I had to file separately for, as a musician and as a small business owner. So there were a lot of headaches like that. And one of the, one of the things that was rolled into the business part, the financials, was uh, getting uh, stability economically because of the waves of uh, record production. You know, mm -hmm. So sometimes like I'd put a record out, we'd sell a bunch of that, and it would cover the overhead of running it because I had a manager at that time. It, it was Steve Marquette, actually, yeah. um, and, and he helped quite a bit. And we, in, our, in our discussions, it became clear that we would need to bring musicians in who had their own record labels. Because Paul Nelson Love and I were selling the most records out of the group of people. And the, the uh, correlation there was Paul has his own label, I have my own label. And, and we were getting those records to Catalytic because we saw the benefit directly of distributing them basically online. Um, so we invited a bunch of musicians like uh, Terry X, um, Andy Moore, Joe Morris, Nate Woolley, um, Abbars and Nick Henneman to come on because they all had their own record labels too, thinking mm -hmm. that that would help you know generate income. And from that point, the next big development was the realization that I wanted Catalytic to be more than just kind of an online record store. Because at that point, that's essentially what it was. We called it a, a co-op just because we called it a co-op. It was a bunch of musicians who were cooperating. It wasn't like, uh, uh, let's say, a socio-political stance on what a collective meant. It was just a term we were throwing around. And I was basically, like Steve Marquette at that point, this was several, like three or four, about four years ago, Steve Marquette was the manager. Um, and then that he, he left and it transferred over to Brock Stuessy, uh, who is really central to the success of catalytic, uh, stabilizing it economically. And the main thing was he, he was the one that pushed the idea and developed the idea of starting subscriptions, mm -hmm. having members, uh, the, 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 the fans became part of the cooperative. And that was kind of the first step, thinking back on it, that, that kind of led it to what a cooperative is. We, we started thinking about it in terms of like a food co-op. Right. And like in a food co-op, you know, you buy into the co-op. Like the farmers, you know, they make the, 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 the produce, but members 
are part of that co-op. They help sustain it by, by getting the funds to the farmers. So we were thinking, okay, the, the, the metaphor there is that the musicians are like the farmers, and we're going to get the fans in as, as, as members of the co-op. They're going to help sustain it. And Brock was brilliant with this, and that actually was the thing that's, that saved it economically, having a steady income every month that we could count on and, and get rid of the, the, the tides of, of, of production from the, the creative side of when the records come out, because they came out at different times. Usually in the summer, there was less product productivity that way, so we'd have like three months where there was almost, there was very little income coming right. in, but we had overhead. You know, we had to pay the manager, uh, we had to pay uh, the designers, etc. So when that happened, one of the things we started to do was put out uh, a thing called Catalytic Quarterly, which we've been doing. There's been 11 issues of it so far. And basically every three months, the partners in the co-op, the musicians, contribute things about their work, things they're involved in. Uh, it's basically about their creative activity and different aspects of it to reveal that to the people who are fans of the music. So it's not only about records, but it's also about ideas and revealing mm -hmm. those kinds of ideas. The first issue of the Quarterly, I was going to sort of write about what the cooperative had become and thinking about it. And for some reason, I started thinking about Spotify. And I started thinking about Spotify and the frustration over Spotify and other streaming services that don't pay the musicians for the content they're profiting, that the, the streaming services are profiting from. And that frustration of another music industry thing taking advantage of the people who are creating the work. Uh, that frustration connected with sort of doing some research about Spotify and their profits and looking at my own career and how the income generators that I could count on in the mid 90s when I started touring and, mm -hmm. and let's say made the shift to being a full time musician uh, from having a day job, you could follow, you know, basically follow the punk rock DIY get in the van model. You know, you could bring records on tour, sell them, and you can still do that on tour. But the big difference is that, let's say you had, I'm just making up numbers now to make it easy, but let's say you had a guarantee of $500 to do a show. Let's say with a Vandermark 5 at that time, a quintet, okay? You would make twice that on record sales, basically. So yeah. a show that paid you $500 really ended up paying you, let's say, $1,200 to $1,500 because of record sales. That's now completely different. So that $500 at 500 euros maybe for the, the guarantee, maybe you make $250 in record sales at a show. Right, and at that really, point in time, the easiest way to get a Vandermark 5 record was to go to the show. Yeah, right, exactly. Because right? exactly. it wasn't in the Tower Records down here. And you could mail order them, but that was like not the thing that it is now. Yeah, everything's different. I mean, I mean, the, the internet. I, um, my history is terrible, but I'm sure it existed. But it, I mean, the way people disseminate it, YouTube didn't exist. I right. mean, I mean, you didn't have digital downloads. Like the whole, the whole landscape of of music production in terms of making objects, making artifacts, um, uh, recordings, all that. I mean, it still was connected to like the indie indie rock model, at least in my world, that came out of the 80s, you know, that right. whole thing, that, you know, with uh, the Minutemen, you know, the Holy Jam Meccano. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that was really, and it worked up until that point. And also, there was the overlap of a lot of, of underground rock fans finding a connection to the kind of music we were making that had a certain kind of, like, intensity, let's say, or energy to it. And there is a ton of aesthetic overlap, I find, in the sort of, like the words are tough but the punk rock scene and the what i call my crazy jazz friends noisemaker mm -hmm. people scene that yeah, aesthetically yeah. there's a lot of overlap there and it's interesting that the business practices started to overlap yeah because we were playing in in rock clubs like half the shows we did on those tours in the in the in the 90s going into the very beginning around 2000 it started to change but definitely in the 90s a lot of the shows i was doing in the states not in Europe, mm -hmm. but in the States, we're at, we're at rock clubs, you know, indie rock clubs. So there was like the, the, the fan base, all these, these models kind of made sense coming out of that DIY scene. Sure. Well, um, even the years you played at the Empty Bottle, 
you know, yeah, absolutely. I said something to a friend of mine who had like different Chicago connections about the, and I sort of referred to the empty bottle as like a creative music space. They're like, dude, what are you talking about? That's just a rock and roll bar. No, yeah. And, and I'm like, well, yeah, but they did these other things during the week. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, that and the the trajectory of the empty bottle in Chicago, as an uh, you know under uh, indie rock, whatever punk, whatever you want to call it, you know, rock club. Its trajectory of, as embracing improvised musicians from around the world. It became like one of the key places mm -hmm. in the world for the kind of music that, that I'm involved in and you're involved in. Um, and, and it was uh, that trajectory of like being a, a rock place, a creative music, and becoming a creative music place, embracing other kinds of music, and its shift back to being a rock place is kind of part of that landscape too. You know, that, that, that these things come in waves. You know, and, and you and you look at the type of rock music that people were listening to in like 2005 versus uh, 1995. You know, the people that were 20 in 1995, their lives are different in 2005. The kinds of aesthetics in the music changed. And if you're still involved, you know, playing like the kind of music I am, yeah, aesthetic shift and stuff, but the key components tend to be consistent and you develop those and go deeper with them, but the audiences are shifting around. So a big part of the reason, if we just talk about, you know, finances, a big part of the reason that I started doing more and more work in Europe in the 2000s was because I had, that helped me survive. Yeah. Now, there were huge creative benefits from that. And getting back to Catalytic, that's one of the reasons Catalytic Sound, the basis of the community and the co-op is international. Because right from the beginning, it included Peter Broetzman, who then left mm -hmm. the group, but he was there at the beginning, Matt Gustafson, Paul Nelson Love, Joe McPhee and I. So already it was, it was European and American, and we kept going with that. So when we added right. the record label folks, it included you know, Joe Morris and Nate Woolley, for example, but also Terry of The X and, and Andy Moore and, Ig and, and Ab with their label. So it, it always maintained this. And when we started the quarterly... You know, like everything, there was no plan other than we should, this sounds like a cool idea, let's do a zine, basically, based on right. these folks, right? So the first issue, I wrote this kind of introduction about, about the group and what we're about, because Brock, again, really pushed, we have to, we have to articulate what, we're, what, we're goals, what our goals are. And if they've changed to be more than an online record store, which is where we started, why are we changing that? What's our agenda? Like, what are we, what, what, yeah, what are our goals? So I was writing this article for the quarterly, and I looked at these, these facts about my own career, like how am I making money now? Like if I'm selling half as many records as I did when I started, and I'm working twice as hard, <laughs> but I'm doing something really wrong, or something's changed. And one of the things that changed is, uh, is streaming services. Yep. The, the advent of that, and, and where the profits go, and they don't go to the musicians. And so that was like where the, the combination of all these things, and again, it wasn't planned, but it was sort of organically generated, was like, okay, you know what Catalytic needs to be is we need to find ways to make money for the people in the co-op, the musicians. The, the goal then needs to be, in addition to selling records, you know, digital and physical copies, we need to think about other creative ways to generate more money for the people involved because they cannot continue to <laughs> lose resources. Right. We have to replace the resources. So rather than you know, go to Spotify and try to argue with them about changing their, their economic policies, which frankly they're not going to do, like any big corporation, yeah. they may talk whatever they want to talk and blame musicians for not being smart enough to make money. And I mean, it's outrageous. So I'll just leave that off because that's a whole rant that doesn't need to be heard right now. But basically, it's like, okay, looking at the landscape, looking at the changes, just personally seeing my friends, because all the people in the co-op, the musicians are all friends of mine. I mean, it's like, what can we do to get money to these people so they can make more music? Right. Like, if everybody's got to do a day job and do, and do three of them now, you know, to make a living, they can't make their music. And, and the fans of the music, if you want to help, let's get money to these folks so they can keep making this amazing stuff, this amazing creative contribution, right? So that was like, that was a pivot point where I said, I need to take this seriously now. Now there's a battle here that I feel responsible for to make more money from my friends. And it's very personal for me. And so 
that changed. There was like a bunch of changes all at once. And that's when we started looking, okay, how do we do this? And the, and the subscription service, uh, the platform that Brock brought in, that was also part of that pivot point. Like, here's a way to do it. We hadn't done that before. So, so that, what, are the, what do the listeners get on the subscription thing? Like, what's that exchange? Uh, if I subscribe, what do I get that I didn't get when I just went and bought a record? Well, the initial subscription uh, was for $25, basically three, you'd get three digital records for free a month. Two of them you could pick. Uh, one of them was a record made exclusively for, for catalytic members that, uh, by the, the musicians involved that, that wasn't available anywhere else. And you would also get like special discounts on the sales that we would hold. You got like a package of um, uh, a T-shirt, a tote bag. Uh, now there's a, one of Dan Jetz's uh, posters for the festival we had in July. Um, you'd also uh, get the quarterly scent every time it came right. out for free. So there was kind of like these these thank you items. But essentially the the core of it was like these these free recordings. Um, and now that the, there's a new platform because we have the, the streaming service that I guess we'll talk about more sure. later. But I mean, basically the, the, there was a giant a seismic shift in the conception of what it was. And when that happened, it's like, okay, if we're going to be a co-op, let's start thinking about what that means to us. So it, it meant that we had to think about who we were bringing in. Because up until that point, it was like people I worked with, you know, and they were friends of mine. Right. And that's still true, but we wanted to really look wider. And one of the, the big things in the improvised music world, at the time that we started making these, these uh, decisions about changing the, the trajectory of what the co-op was, <clears throat> one of the ongoing problems was representation of women in, in, uh, in the music, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of concerts, in terms of like ensembles, and, and really we, we said, look, we've got to bring more women into the group because this imbalance needs to be uh, dealt with, right? And then connected to that was like we have to include a wider range of people, you know, and so especially with like so many levels of realization in 2020 about like the levels of unbelievable injustice going on. We started saying, okay, like we've got to have to be more representational of what the landscape looks like. And our, and, and the community we have, like, like I said already is international. So we're trying to, we're trying to, and that's because of the way it, it, it developed organically and combined with that, you know, like when, when COVID hit, all the jobs, like it, we, no one could work. Well, there were, there, I mean, the online concert started a little afterward. Uh, I mean, ESS Experimental Sound Studio in Chicago, man. I mean, what they've been doing with the quarantine concerts, but also other uh, other folks and other people coming up with amazing solutions for what's happened and is continuing to happen. It was like we were already a catalytic. We were already thinking about like how do we make money for musicians, you know, in the in the co-op, and now we get hit with COVID. So we already had some things in place to like, okay, what can we do with what we have here, like in terms of tools? So the first thing was like, okay, we have been paying people out every three months. Now we pay everybody every month. We changed the, right. the, the platform for that because everyone has bills every month. So we kept like adapting things. We, we did the online festival and paid like 30 people uh, equally from that. Uh, you know, and we started thinking, well, what else can we do? And part of what got rolled into that was like, Everybody in the group, like any human being, is like over, I mean, I can't even articulate it, like looking day in and day out between Trump, between the racism going on, between the catastrophe of COVID and not, and not being handled here. It's like this, this empathy for like we have to try to do something. And the primary goal of Catalytic is to get economic, you know, get funds to the musicians so they can continue continue right. to do your, their work. That's the primary goal, and wrapped into that is like, what can we do to try to help people who are doing amazing things to fight these injustices, particularly connected to Black Lives Matter. And so, what we did is then take the the artist albums that were going to the members only that we just talked mm -hmm. about for free. We started releasing those to the public for the first time and selling those and all the sales, all the money generated would be donated to organizations that the musicians on the record wanted to give funds to. Right. So, so it was like, it, it, all of these things weren't planned. Obviously we didn't know COVID was coming 
Um, but I think the, since the beginning, the decisions were all generated organically, like what should we do? It wasn't like we had a five-year plan. <laughs> I don't even know if we had a six-month plan. <laughs> right. but we, we, we were like kind of seeing how things should, should go forward. And one of the things that was key, both symbolically but also to find another way to generate funds, was to find a way to do a streaming service that would pay the musicians fairly for their work. And, and so that's been a big thing that came out of this year. I mean, 2020 was like one crisis after another for everyone everywhere, but some amazing things came out of mm -hmm. it. And I am very thankful for my involvement in the, in the co-op and the people who are in it because the feedback from the musicians and their ideas, it just underscored just how brilliant they are and how generous they are and how, how working together we've been able to do so many incredible things. So that's kind yeah. of like an overview. So let's talk about the streaming service. That's okay. it's included in the like the top level rock star patron membership. <laughs> but then there's also a just the streaming service yes. membership. Yes, that's right. And and so what do you get for that? How's it work? Because I from reading the literature, I haven't actually subscribed and checked it out yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it seems like the the labels on the streaming change monthly. Tell me tell me how that works. Yeah. Well, this is another example of how doing something leads to doing other things. And we, we had been talking about the streaming service for like a couple of years. This past year, we started like wor working on it more in depth. We, we brought uh, web designers, programmers on who are, who are amazing guys, uh, uh, Santiago and, and Max. I mean, they, I mean, I don't know what they, how they do what they do, but they, they, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't exist without them. And basically, the technical part, which I don't fully understand, but understand a little bit of, it's using SoundCloud technology and then creating a face for it that works like a streaming service that people right. use. Um, and so to answer your actual question, there's a series of 30 records that are curated uh, both by the, the front desk at, at Catalytic, but also like a musician each, each month will choose um, records from the, the, the catalog that are digitally available, which is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of records. And it's kind of based on the movie idea, the, the films, the movie streaming service, where a, a record rolls out like they did with a movie, like one leaves every every day and the new one comes in. So there's this this ongoing set of new records happening, and that's like the the top. Let's say the the one of the tiers within the streaming service is the catalytic uh, artist, the, the musician records, and that and because it's manual, it's not. We don't have an algorithm. Like all this stuff is done kind of by hand. Uh, for the for the listener, it's all like you know seamless. But the benefit of the manual aspect is that we can choose the records, and then the musicians can write about why they like the records. And the idea for that came from Christoph Kurtzman, who is now joining the co-op, uh, talking to him about, like, you know, one thing you should do at Catalytic is have a radio station and have DJs where they talk about the music. Like, that's one of the things that was really lost when radio started, you know, there was more and more streaming and less and less right. radio, was the impact the DJ had on knowledge, you mm -hmm. know? And so, so we've been able to do that. Like, you know, let's say, for example, I, I'd pick a Joe McPhee record. Let's say it was tenor, and I can say, you know, this record changed my life, and, and this started me thinking about music differently, and this is why I selected it to be part of this month's, uh, you know, uh, set of recordings. So there's that tier. Then there's a tier which all the artist albums, that you know, the unique records, exclusive records mm -hmm. that have been made, are available, the whole catalog, and that will keep building. Every month there's a new record, so the subscribers can get all those, and, and as it builds as a library. Then there's a, a, a tier called History is, what, is What's Happening, which is a, a bunch of records that are in the deep catalog you know, from, let's say, the 90s or even earlier, like some records, early records by the X. You know, those, those get selected and put in there. And it's like, that's part of it is that, that, that when you used to be able to go to a record store, you, maybe you like Thelonious Monk, 
and you didn't know anything about John Coltrane for some reason. And you saw, hey, John Coltrane's on this record. I don't have this Monk record. Well, who the hell is John Coltrane? You go over to that stack. And then, right. and, and then you see these records from, like, it's not only new records. Like, the new records are definitely one of the primary economic drivers for Catalytic. But the catalog and the history there, you know, a record from 1990 can be just as glorious as a record from 2021. And it's like getting people to think about those records and check them out. So there's like that history thing. Now, I mentioned briefly that, that Catalytic Sound had a music festival, and it was online. It was in July. And again, it's, a situa it's, a, it's an example of like, you know, you have a catastrophe. Like we were going to do a normal festival. Like we were planning on that. We were doing grant writing for that. COVID hits. There's no live concerts anymore. So what are we going to do? And because I was working with Experimental Sound Studio on the option series, and we had gone to the streaming, I knew about what they were doing with the streaming, we piggybacked with them and did an online festival. Now, on one hand, we lost a lot, because nothing is going to replace regular concerts. Like, that's just, you can, you can create alternatives right now, which are amazing, like the online concerts, but everyone wants to play live, wants to work with musicians in a group, wants to be in front of an audience, mm -hmm. and that day will come back. One of the benefits of having the online festival, however, was that we could include everybody from the co-op, everybody from Europe. Like we were going to bring over a couple of folks from Europe because that's all we could have afforded to do with the flight, etc. But now we could pre present everybody. And also we, we included panel discussions to talk about different aspects of the music. And I was surprised that the panel discussions were incredibly popular. Like, we had 100-plus people for all the panels, not just the concerts, which was like, holy crap. And the panels were super exciting and very thought-provoking. And one of the things that came out of the panel discussions is the label tier on the, on, the, uh, on the streaming platform. We weren't thinking about that. When we were developing it, we were almost done, like, this, right. uh, in the summer of 2020. It was going to kind of be launched in September, That was, and we were very close to doing that. <clears throat> Nate Cross... Uh, of Astral Spirits, you know, checked out the festival in July, was super excited about the conversations that were happening and said, I want to be involved with Catalytic somehow. And we, talk, we talked to him about the streaming service, and he's like, I want to be involved in this. Let's get a label uh, tier going. So Nate's been the point person for that idea mm -hmm. and then working with these other labels. So there's a tier on, on the streaming service which totally cha transformed what's possible for us in the streaming service because there's uh, uh, five core labels, includes uh, No Business Records, Core versus Denby, Ast Astral Spirits, uh, uh, Relative Pitch, and I am spacing out on the other one right now, so apologies to them. But basically, it's a core group of, of folks. They curate five records each from their, from their label. And... Some of those labels may include musicians that are part of the catalytic group, mm -hmm. and some of them not. And again, it's like the record store. You know, oh, you know, Luke Stewart did this record on, on Astral Spirits? Or what, what's this other record that they just put out? You know, and and right. so, so they curate those chunks, and then there's going to be a, a guest label every month so we can like broaden out who's part of the thing. So different smaller labels, maybe they have not as deep a catalog because they're newer or whatever right. it might be. And so that whole tier will also be rotating constantly. So you have like basically a hundred access to a hundred records uh, as, as through the streaming. And then of course there's ways to purchase those records, either physical copies, copies or digital versions. If you want to, it's it's like kind of a seamless process through the streaming service. But basically that's what we're providing from from the content aspect. Now, because this didn't exist. Uh, we were concerned with the, the legal aspects of this, <clears throat> and we wanted to make sure that the musicians all knew that they owned everything. That right. basically Catalytic was licensing this material from them and the labels that have agreed to, uh, to use this for the streaming service. And that all the, f the funds that come in from the subscription, two-thirds of that money goes to the catalytic musicians. One third goes to uh, catalytic as a business to, to make, you know, help pay right. for the overhead. The labels essentially are, this is advertising for them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're responsible to, to compensate their artists 
for the use of that material uh, in a way that that's, uh, correlates to what the artists are getting paid here. So two-thirds of the su subscription amount, whether it's like the, the rock star version of subscribing right. or the individual version um, of just the platform, the streaming platform itself, that two-third chunk gets divided evenly amongst all the uh, catalytic artists. And, and that money goes to them. And we wanted to make sure that this was all like super transparent and that they were protected and that we should get a licensing agreement for this. Mm -hmm. Not to, because not to, everything's basically been a handshake with Catalytic. And because there wasn't a precedent for this, let's do it all the way down. Like, let's get it all thoroughly uh, done, done, let's say professionally, so to speak. So they know they're protected. And so part of what came out of that was, okay, we, we got a really amazing lawyer who is super innovative and worked with us. And it's a musician-friendly contract which so far I haven't really seen one of those <laughs> where I understand what the language means. Right. So, so we worked with this guy, George for months to, and he, you know, he did the nuts and bolts like specifics, but like to get the language straightforward on the front page, so everybody knows exactly what they're signing on to. And then it gets broken down into pieces and, and it's like a professional contract. So, so part of what we're, we're driving at here is that, because we keep thinking, okay, what do we need to do? What's right for the musicians? What, what's the best thing to do? The idea of the streaming service came in. Then the idea of adding the labels came in. And then getting a, a licensing contract came in. You know, all right. to try to, 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 to be musician forward with this. And then part of the beauty of this is that it's symbolic of the possibility of doing this. Like, we were able to do it. It's not the... I, and what I'm hoping is that it's not going to be the only one. That it's, it's a model, just like right. like Catalytic itself is a model, not the model for what a co-op is, but a model of what a community of musicians can do together to take more control of their own revenues and their own, therefore, creative future because we've got to pay our bills. And so one thing we're doing now and we're working on it, and it's going to come out early this year, is a manual about the catalytic history, about how we generated what we're doing and how we didn't have these goals set up, how organically it is an international community. But ideally, and this was something that came out of the conversations at the festival, Andy Moore brought up the thing, it's like, it'd be amazing to have a version of catalytic in Amsterdam. And then it's like, holy crap, what if, what if we could create a model to show that we're not gatekeepers for the concept of like doing a co-op or that you're in the co-op and that means that if you're not, you're not cool or your music isn't amazing. The thing is that there's an interconnection of all the participants, all the musicians in Catalytic, but it would be incredible if we could, if there could be uh, co-ops in Berlin, Amsterdam, Western Massachusetts, in, in, you know, <laughs> in New Orleans, all these musicians having a community meeting their own needs because the resources that a group of musicians in Berlin have are totally different than a group in Chicago or the Catalytic have. They maybe have grant resources, funding resources, we just won't have, but they can have. So, it, and then these, these different groups could share information. Like we can share the information about how we did the streaming service. Right. And if there are more of these things happening, more of that money is going to the musicians and not the friggin' industry uh, corporations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's like this one idea after another idea after another idea generated by doing it and then finding the next thing you got to do, basically. Yeah, that's fabulous. That's, yeah, wow. So there were like 18 questions that I came up with. Along okay, so I, I just keep talking. So no, that's good. That's, that's how it's supposed to go. Um, I find the talking about, you know, who's in the co-op and not, I find that there is an aesthetic consistency to to the catalytic catalog, mm -hmm. right? I, I feel like it does, like I have some idea of what to expect mm. in, in some range when I like go to the website and say, oh, what's this sound like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. you know, bringing in, say like Claire Russe, the music that she makes aesthetically fits with the other things that are going on. Right, right, I see your point, yep. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, on the, the streaming thing, so the idea is not to have a pay $10 a month and you can hear everything in the world sort of service. It's almost more like a discovery service. Yeah, yeah, that's like, an interesting way to put it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that, because uh, on the, the more popular space, it's, you know, I have teenage kids. 
And so like my 19 year old daughter, we're, I was just asking her, like, what do you use when you listen? Like we have a family Apple music plan and she's like, oh, if I want to listen to something specific, I do that. But if I just want to have like music on radio style, she'll go to Pandora because that does that better than the Apple music, you know, whatever mm -hmm. pop station or whatever. So yeah, I could see this functioning totally as the, I'm into like music that makes me think but I don't want to have to pick out a record. I can just go here and hit play mm -hmm, and get mm -hmm. this assortment of, of things to listen to and maybe find some cool new stuff that I didn't know in the process. Right. Right. That's, that's definitely the part of the goal. There's no question about it. And part of it's just out of practicality. Like initially, you know, not knowing anything about the technology when we started, started investigating like how to do this, that was the thought. Like we take everything that's digitized in the catalog, which is most of it. And you just like, people can just listen to everything. But there was no way to do that with the, the economic resources we have. Like, we built this thing on a shoestring budget. Right. You know, which is part of why it's exciting because it means that, you know, people can do this. Like, you know, people like me, you know, mm -hmm. working with, with people who are really brilliant and, and, and those contributions that come in. So it became clear that the idea of, like, just making everything available and you stream it, like, more like what, let's say, a typical streaming service is that wasn't going to be possible for us. So, th and, that, and the benefit of that, however, is that things become hand-picked. And let's say you're a fan of, uh, yeah, Claire, Claire Rousse. And she, she's picking records, and Claire says, yeah, I like this and this and this, and this is why. And hearing Claire Rousse say, just make something up, I love Ikaway Mori's album, such and such, because it, it opened up this door for me. Man, if you're a fan of Claire's, and you don't know about Ikaway, What's a better entry point right. to Ikaway's world, yeah. right? Or, so or vice versa. Yeah, right. yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's kind of like you said, it's like, it's like a doorway into like all these things because it's much, way much, it's much more personalized than an algorithm. And part of that's just out of the practicality. Like we have a limit to how many records we can get on, uh, create access to uh, in terms of, you know, the space available for what we can, we can make available, you know, right. because we're using a SoundCloud technology. Well, and it's almost like better on some level to have less choice. And I mean, and the choice is huge. I mean, it's it's like an ongoing hundred changing out records all the time. I mean, it's not like limited. And then and then the beauty of having these other labels as as a core part of of the the program. I mean, that's huge. Like that's a game changer for us because you know you have uh, it's going to be thirty musicians as I mentioned, like going into mm -hmm. twenty twenty one. Uh, which will be the cap of, of like the size of the group because then we can't economically right. it's just too big and, and bureaucratically it becomes too way too complicated. So with thirty musicians, like that's a huge catalog of records, but it's also you know people are going to continue to make work. But by having these labels in and their catalogs included, we've busted this thing wide open. And like, for example, Corbett versus Dempsey, one of the great things that they're doing with their label is all the archive stuff. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just amazing. Like, j just one example of the ICP music from like the mid 60s that they put out, or is, I guess officially going to be released uh, in February or whatever. I mean, like just as a document, as a fan of the music, like their archive work, oh, that's different than what Catalytic's doing in terms of the, what those musicians are doing. You know what I mean? Sure. So it, it opens up a whole new thing for fans. So it's like a, it's like an old-fashioned record store in a way. Well, know, and there's the thing the of effect. of them putting out those that early Joe McPhee stuff, right? Which right. has so much to do with informing all of the aesthetic choices of so many of the artists in the Catalytic Co-op. Exactly. Exactly. So, so picking, you know, the, working on which labels to include and asking and, and getting there, you know, they, all the labels included, like, they were like, man, yes, let, let, incredible, let's do it. Like, they, they totally see what we're trying to do. They're excited about it. They want to be part of it. They're contributing to it. So it's like all, all the, the organic process that we've gone through, it's like it's always been about intuition and what feels right. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been like, like we, to keep it to the, the streaming platform and the labels being included, that was never part of the plan. Like, we were almost done with the streaming service, and Nate uh, Cross brought this idea to us, and we're like, okay, hold the presses. we got to include this. This is too good an idea. And so right. it, it basically added another five months or four months to the, to the process because, of course, you know, with, with the programming and everything, that changed stuff. Right. And, but it was worth it. 
So now in January, the thing launches and it's like a beauty, man. It's like, it's so, it's so exciting. And like to have worked on it for two years or whatever, and then going into overdrive this year for this, this idea, it's, it's so important to me. And, and I hope that people see it as bigger than a streaming service for, for improvised music and musicians to do it. It's, it's, it's a symbolic statement about musicians taking control of their own work.